NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory presents the Von Karman Lecture, a series of talks by scientists and engineers who are exploring our planet, our solar system, and all that lies beyond. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Mark Razzi from the Public Services Office at JPL. And again, want to thank you so much for joining us for this edition of the Von Karman series. Tonight, we're going to explore the infrared spectrum, or at least some of it. Now, William Herschel first discovered the infrared in 1800, but it wasn't until the mid 20th century that real research into that part of the spectrum began. But when it did, it began in earnest. There have been many instruments, telescopes, and spacecraft that have all worked to reveal mysteries hidden in the infrared, but there are still plenty of unanswered questions. Tonight, our guests, who are but two of very many people working on these projects, by the way, are going to talk about two upcoming missions that hope to deepen our understanding of our universe by continuing to delve into the infrared. Helping me out tonight with the Q&A is our co-host, JPL Public Outreach Specialist, Caitlin Soares, Hi, Caitlin. Hello and welcome everyone. As Mark mentioned, my name is Caitlin and I work in public outreach at JPL. We have a fascinating program for you tonight and we want you to be involved in the conversation. So please ask questions in the chat and we'll try to address as many of them as possible tonight throughout our discussion. If you don't see the chat for some reason, please refresh your browser and it should appear. And I'll turn it back over to Mark now so he can introduce our brilliant speakers for tonight's program. Thank you very much, Caitlin. So our guests tonight are Dr. Dita Markovich, who is a research scientist at JPL working on the Euclid mission, and Dr. Phil Korngut, who is a research scientist at Caltech and the instrument scientist on the SphereX mission. Good evening, my friends. How are you guys? All right. Good, super I'm happy to be here. To be here. <laughs> Thanks, our pleasure. So Phil, to set the stage, uh, would you be so kind to give us a little bit of a primer on the electromagnetic spectrum? Sure, be happy to. All right. Well, uh, when you think about fundamental measurements in astronomy, there's really one observable we're talking about, and that's electromagnetic radiation. Now, you're more familiar with that term by its colloquial term, light. And uh, all the signals that we're measuring from the gamma ray through X-ray and all the way to the radio, those are all just different flavors of light. And the parameter which, which governs that flavor is what we call wavelength. So uh, what you're looking at here in this, in this plot is the electromagnetic spectrum that is accessible to astronomers. That x-axis there in wavelength is a logarithmic scale and it spans 15 orders of magnitude. So that's literally a factor of a million times a billion in the available light that's out there. The way you think about those different flavors in, in terms of your real world is is in color except uh it's far outreaching from what your eyeballs are used to if we go to the next slide you can see in context the optical which is every you know piece of light that you've ever seen in your life from blue to red which spans only about you know less than a factor of two in wavelength so that's a pretty wild concept to to think about there's a million billion colors out there you could see uh, you know, just over a factor of two of them. So there's all sorts of uh, observables which which uh, can trace all sorts of stuff from astronomical objects. It's not a surprise why your eyeballs work in that wavelength range called the optical. If you click on the next slide, we'll show the spectrum, the emission spectrum of your very favorite source, or at least the one that is most common here on Earth, which is the star that is our hometown, or the sun, which is about uh, on the order of 5,700 degrees Kelvin, and its spectrum looks like that, which peaks in the optical. On the next slide, we'll kind of zoom in on, on that neighborhood. And, uh, you know, the, the peak of the sun, which is right there around green at a few hundred nanometers wavelength, just redder than red, so at longer wavelengths than your eyeballs work at, is the near infrared. And that's, that's the, the region that we're interested in, in discussing today. And there's all sorts of interesting uh, sources out there, uh, nominally things which are emitting thermally in the infrared. So things that are not quite as hot as the sun that go down to thousands to even, you know, hundreds of degrees Kelvin. Uh, 
Now there's a problem why, with uh, you know doing that kind of observation here on our hometown of the Earth. If you click to the next slide, you can see what our atmosphere does. So uh, while Earth's atmosphere is great for things like breathing and uh, living on, it's not so great for looking through. So all of those magenta lines that you're seeing there, that's absorption features in our Earth's atmosphere. So, um, you know, while air looks clear to you in the optical, if you look in the near infrared, it's, it's not really clear at all. There's all sorts of stuff uh, absorbing. Not to mention that everything, you know, that's here on Earth that's, uh, you know, kind of room temperature is actually glowing in, in light and emitting. So it really makes sense when you're doing astronomy in the near infrared to get off of this planet and go up into space. So, Dita, then, if you would be so kind, tell us why the spectra are so important in astronomy. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. So I guess what I should say first is that astronomy is kind of like detective work. It's not quite like other science where you can, you know, put something in a lab and poke it and see what happens and then, you know, figure out the laws of nature that way in astronomy. The things that we're interested in are really, really far away. So what, all we can do is kind of sit here and hope that information will, you know, on its own come to reach us. And so things that we observe, you know, we look at stars. And if you're a cosmologist like Phil and I, you look at things that are much, much further away than stars, like galaxies. And so what we do is we sit here and we collect the information that's coming to us from, our, from those galaxies. And the most common way this information reaches us is through light. And we're talking about the electromagnetic spectrum today, so so that's of course uh, what I'm talking about here. And so so this light comes from these really distant galaxies to us, and we build these huge collectors of light or telescopes to to capture it. And then of course we examine all the information. We try to get all the information that's in this light. And one of the things that we do is we break it up into its component wavelengths or frequencies or energies, uh, which is basically the spectrum that Phil has been telling you about. And these spectra, they contain uh, basically a fingerprint, a really specific pattern that tells us a lot about the chemical properties, the thermal properties, and the kinematic properties of the thing that's emitting that light. So the light source, so the properties of the stars and of the galaxies. And so we can have, you know, we can have like uh, very small ranges in, 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 in wavelength or frequency where there's a bit of extra light in there. And those are called emission lines. Or we can have part of the spectrum where there's a little bit less light. So if you if you show the next picture, you can see um, I've sort of made a little a picture that shows a kind of a pattern of these uh, absorption lines where there's a little bit less light and there's an emission light with a little bit more light and this is a specific pattern we can that we can understand really well because it the, the exact pattern of the emission absorption lines uh, comes out of quantum physics and we can play around with this in the lab and and actually calculate exactly where these lights might appear might appear for you know in different if you have different types of stuff that's emitting the light the light different gases at different temperatures and what's also really cool is that something really interesting happens to this pattern. And uh, if, if there's some kind of motion of the emitter of this light. So let me first um, tell you about the Doppler effect. So you, you might have heard of it before, and it's an effect that happens in sound. Um, and it's, it's, I'm sure you've all, even if you don't know the expression Doppler effect, you would have experienced it. Because an example of it is if you have an emergency vehicle that has a siren that's moving towards you. And, and if the emergency vehicle is moving towards you, it's as if, as if the waves, the sound waves are getting squished together and so the pitch of the siren you know is higher than usual uh, and if it's if the emergency vehicle is hopefully moving away from you um, then it's as if the sound waves get stretched out and the pitch falls so the siren as it approaches you it's it's high pitched and then as it moves past you and goes away from you the pitch falls and something kind of similar happens in light and it's really interesting but the the big difference is um, one of the big differences is that the thing that is emitting this light needs to be moving with respect to the observer. So its speed with respect to you has to be a lot higher than of that emergency vehicle. In fact, this light emitter needs to be traveling at a significant fraction of the speed of light. So you might say close to the speed of light for this kind of shifting effect to be observable. So what happens is if you have a distant galaxy that is for some mysterious reason moving away from you, the wavelength, it's as if the wavelength of light gets stretched out, um, it gets red shifted. And uh, so the, 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 any, the pattern 
moves towards the red part of the spectrum. And if the galaxy was moving towards you, the light would get blue shifted. So this specific pattern, this fingerprint that we can understand moves towards the blue. And so you can measure this red shift or blue shift. And about a hundred years ago, there was somebody called Vesto Slifer who tried to measure, uh, you know, he, he looked at a bunch of things that he called nebulae, but uh, we now call galaxies because we know that they're outside of our own Milky Way. So he measured a bunch of red shifts and, uh, and he noticed that in fact, there were mostly red shifts and there was already a handful of galaxies that where he actually found blue shifts. And then sometime later, somebody called Hubble came along and he looked at this data and he supplemented it with other data. And he looked at it and he said, OK, let's measure the distances to these galaxies and see if there's a relationship between redshift and distance. And so if we if we look at the sky and we look at all of these galaxies and we measure redshifts, we might get a picture uh, like, like the next picture that I have here for you. This was this picture was actually made a lot after after um, Slifer and Hubble. This was from a, an experiment called Two Mass. Um, so th here you have lots of little dots and they have different colors and the different colors correspond to different measurements of redshift. So this is what this would look like on the sky. And, but what if, so, so as I said before, what if Hubble said, what if we can measure distances to all of these galaxies and see if there's a relationship? In fact, there is a relationship and I have an equation for you now. So brace yourselves. So if you show the next picture, it's the only equation I promise. And it's just to illustrate the importance of the redshift distance relation. So what you're seeing here on the left-hand side, there's a D with a subscript A, and that's the angular diameter distance as we call it. And on the right-hand side, there's the letter C, which is the speed of light the speed of light, we have the letter Z, which is the redshift, and then an integral of one over a function called H, that's called the Hubble function. And that Hubble function contains all the information, well, a lot of the information about what the universe is made of. And it tells you a lot about the history of our cosmos. So if you can measure the D, the distance, and if you, if you can measure the Z, the redshift, so this is the distance redshift relation, then you can infer so much about our cosmology, about this H function, about what the universe is made of and its cosmic history. And so now, if I can show you a picture of what happens if you if you connect distances and redshifts together. So these dots on this picture, this is again from two mass, they're all different galaxies and the colors denote uh, the redshifts. And of course, distance is distance. And we sit in the center, we're the observer. And you can see that redshift increases with distance. And so when Hubble realized this, of course, he didn't have a picture as nice as this, but he had something like that. When he realized, he, when he saw this relationship, he said, oh, wait a minute, that must mean that the universe itself is expanding. Space itself is pulling these galaxies apart so that those that are the furthest away from us are seem to be moving away from us at the highest speed. And so this way, if we can make these kinds of three-dimensional ma um, uh, maps of the universe, of the, of, the of the distribution of galaxies in the universe, we can look both far away into space, but we can also look far away into the past. And that's because light has a finite speed so that if i'm receiving if i'm looking at a galaxy with of course a big telescope it's very very far away what i'm seeing is not the galaxy as it is today but a galaxy the galaxy as it was when light left this galaxy which may well have been billions and billions of years ago and so this way as we look into the distance we look into the cosmic past and phil i think has a nice picture to show you what happens if you look through you well you might what you might see if you look through the cosmic past Right. Yeah. So uh, if we bring up the next slide, uh, let's, uh, you know, look at some of the implications of those concepts that Dita just in, in introduced. Right. So this figure is, is a cartoon of uh, the history and the evolution of the universe. That arrow that goes from left to right represents uh, time from the very beginning until today, which is all the way on the right side, where you see today the structure of the universe as, as we know it, that has all sorts of galaxies populating this cosmic web of structure. And, you know, this diffuse light that's, that's, uh, that's out there today that came from all sorts of tidal interactions in the history of uh, the evolution of galaxies where, you know, fly, um, stars get flung out way into their um, exerts. So if we think about observing today in the near infrared, all of those galaxies in their what's called a rest frame, so in, in today's uh, unredshifted wavelengths, they're emitting 
in the in the near infrared and they they peak there because they have a bunch of stars which are you know cooler than 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 our sun but if we think about now looking further away hence further back in time also since the universe is expanding we're looking at sources that are redshifted far away so if you go all the way back to about you know uh, only um you know, 10 to tens of billions of years ago, uh, the first stars and galaxies, which were forming out of the, the, the neutral hydrogen, which cooled and, and condensed, and those first stars turned on, emitting in their rest frame ultraviolet, so really blue and really hot, that's now redshifted into, into our uh, observation. So um, when we talk about the infrared background, another term that we use is the extragalactic background light, we're thinking about the integral, we're measuring the integrated light production in all of cosmic history. And it turns out that the, uh, when we look at the structure today in galaxies, the way they're populating in this web, all of that structure was seeded at the very earliest epochs, uh, right after the Big Bang in an epoch called inflation. So there are these two epochs in, 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 uh, of, of rapid expansion in cosmic history, that early epoch of inflation, and then today where dark energy uh, is taking over and is expanding our universe uh, uh, rapidly. So the large scale structure today is tied to those earliest epochs through what was seeded as quantum fluctuations, which I'm going to pass it back to uh, Dita to tell you a bit about. Yeah, Dita, if you would be so kind, can you elaborate on those a bit? Yes, I'm happy to. In fact, I can even show you an animation. So if you show the next thing that we have to show, thank you. So there's something really strange happening if you look at empty vacuum of space. So if you were able to go into the vacuum and see what it looks like, it might look pretty boring to you. But if you could zoom in and look on the tiniest microscopic quantum scales, you would see that it's anything but boring. Now, of course, we can't do that. We can't see these scales. Even with the best microscopes, we can only see hints of it. And we certainly can't observe what we um, you know, this, this kind of thing that I'm showing you here. And what I'm showing you here is called quantum fluctuation. It's kind of like this bubbling on quantum scales. And what's happening is that basically out of nowhere, uh, pairs of particles and antiparticles are as if they're borrowing energy from empty space and coming into existence. And then a small fraction of a second later, they're annihilating each other and returning this energy back into space. And this was actually also happening at the very, very beginning of the universe, except that back then things were even stranger. The, at the very, very first moments of our universe, the universe was really dense and really hot. And then these things were bubbling, the quantum fluctuations were happening. And suddenly space itself started to expand in a really, really dramatic way, not just expand, but accelerate so it was speeding up the expansion was speeding up as as phil mentioned and we call this process in the early universe we call it inflation and we don't really understand what drove it and why it happened and we don't understand the thing that's powering it but as the universe expanded it also the density dropped and it cooled and this thing that was powering this inflation it underwent something that we call you could call a phase transition so what happened was that the cooling push this strange stuff to decay into more familiar particles of you know that make us up and that are, you know that we can interact with also a bunch of other weird stuff on the side but that's too and so the universe was expanding and and as inflation was over very quickly a very small fraction of a second um it it what it had done is it pulled these quantum fluctuations from these tiny microscopic scales to macroscopic observable scales and so these this these little these little uh bumps they were kind of small and big bumps on all scales were frozen in so they didn't bubble anymore but they were there also on observable microscopic scales. And so and, and so what we had now after a very maybe you know a very small amount of time at the beginning of the universe, we had this this lumpy soup that was made up of you know particles of normal matter but also of dark matter. And so this lumpy soup of course was being governed by the laws of physics. So it felt gravity and it felt pressure. So these little lumps in the soup felt pressure and they suddenly started inflating into these bubbles of sound. So sound was propagating through the this early universe and so and now 
you know, this situation kind of lasted for hundreds of thousands of years. So we're going, we've gone from a fraction of a second to hundreds of thousands of years. And after some hundreds of thousands of years, the, the sound stopped propagating because the density dropped so much. And th th these, these bubbles of sound that were propagating through, they got frozen in. So I'm going to have an animation for you to show you these bubbles of sound and what happened afterwards. So the bubbles of sound, uh, so if you go to the next animation, please, um, the bubbles of sound were also, un, you know, uh, influenced by gravity. So the, the shells of these bubbles fragmented under gravity and collapsed into galaxies. But galaxies also formed at the centers of the bubbles, and that was because of dark matter. So dark matter didn't feel this pressure at the be beginning of the universe. It didn't, you know, sound wasn't propagating through it. So it kind of remained in the locations of those original lumps. And then it also attracted lots of normal matter towards them. And that's what uh, that normal matter then fragmented under gravity into galaxies and collapsed. And the really cool thing about, thing about these bubbles is that the physics to calculate their size is pretty straightforward. So we can actually calculate how big we expect them to be today. So this is 150 megaparsecs. And, and so if we look at the sky and we know how big these bubbles are supposed to be, if we can see them, and measure how big they appear, then we could measure distances. So it turns out that these bubbles were discovered uh, in astronomy um, about 15 years ago. They're called baryonic acoustic oscillations, uh, formally, and they are an amazing measure of distance throughout a huge amount of the universe. So looking back into the past, you can measure distances to really distant galaxies, but you can only do it statistically. So using this, this measurement uh, of, 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 this, of distance that, is, that works so well, and then measuring the redshifts of the galaxies that make up these bubbles, um, then you can do, calculate this distance redshift relation and you can see this effect. You can see the effect that, the un as Phil mentioned, that the universe started accelerating, uh, uh, so the expansion of the universe started accelerating again billions of years after inflation. And this accelerated expansion, uh, is we say that it's fueled by dark energy, as Phil mentioned, and we don't really know what dark energy is. And so, in fact, dark energy and inflation are two of the biggest mysteries of modern physics. And that's really exciting to, to work on. That's really, really cool. Um, so let me call for the next slide and kind of summarize what you two have talked about so far. So there have been two epochs where the expansion of the universe was speeding up. Uh, the first epoch was called inflation, and then the current expansion, which is due to dark energy. Uh, there's a wealth of information related to both of these phenomena buried in the large scale structure of the universe. And these two missions are going to help us you know, pull some of that out. So the Euclid mission will probe the structure at about half the age of the universe, if I got that right. And from that, we'll infer what dark energy is doing to the universe's expansion today. And then the Sphere X mission will survey a huge volume of large scale structure in the nearby universe. And from that will teach us about the energy field or fields that drove inflation in the first instance of cosmic history. So Phil, let's bring you back. Um, if you'd please uh, tell us about the Sphere X mission that you're working on. All right, yeah, well, uh, I've got an overview on the next slide. And so SphereX is, uh, is indeed uh, another, it's a tortured acronym. It stands for <laughs> the Spectrophotometer for the History of the Universe Epic of Reionization Explorer. And um, it's designed really as, as one of the first uh, missions where not only are we going to make a map of the whole sky in imaging, but we're going to take a spectrum towards every single pointing at a resolution of six arc seconds in the entire universe. And from that huge data set, we've optimized further to really get at these three main science themes. The first is, as we've been discussing, to measure the large scale structure in today's universe. So tracing all the galaxies as they populate this cosmic web. And by doing statistics on the relations and how clumpy and clustered they are, to tie that back to those quantum fluctuations at the, at the real dawn um, during inflation. But also, we're going to measure that integrated light field in the extragalactic background light. And from that, to disentangle the various components which came from that epoch of reionization, the, or the, the time when the, those first stars and galaxies were turning on and, and evolving through cosmic time till today, where there's all sorts of diffuse light that's gotten flung out to the far reaches of exurbs. But also, at our uh, more close to home, in our own neighborhood of the Milky Way, so the, our parent galaxy that we live in, 
we're going to use this very um, uh, this significant feature of absorption that comes from ice. So just water ice, and we're going to survey our galactic plane in our neighborhood for water ice absorption. And as we know, at least on Earth, where we're looking for life, uh, we're looking for water. And so most of the ice, most of the water in the universe is actually not liquid. It's in ice form. So Spherix is going to survey the galactic plane for water ice absorption. Uh, on the next slide, I'll show you a movie uh, of how we implement this. So Spherex, it, it lives in what we call a sun-synchronous low Earth polar orbit. So at about 700 kilometers over the Earth, we're going around on this Terminator line. So it's always sunrise or sunset for Spherex. And we keep our solar panels there to the our back to the sun to keep us nice and charged up and powered. Now you can see as, as we pan up, Spherex has these set of three nestled shields. We call them photon shields. Their job is to block the radiation which is coming up off the Earth, the thermal radiation from the Earth, as well as the sunlight from getting to the core of Spherex, which is that telescope you can see there. This telescope, because we're working in the near infrared, has to be cooled to really low temperatures. And we do so passively using the actual cold of deep space. Doing that, we can cool this telescope down to 40 Kelvin. Uh, you know, most of us, at least in America, think in terms of Fahrenheit. That's the equivalent of minus 387 Fahrenheit. And we need to get down that, that low to control the emission, actually the light emitted from our telescope. Uh, at the core of Spherex is uh, what we call a linear variable filter, an LVF. And I've got a picture of one on the next slide. And this is where we get all of our spectroscopic power. It's a really efficient way of doing this in space. It's a little piece of actually of sapphire, which has a very special optical coating on it, which only transmits selected wavelengths depending on where you land on the filter. So in that picture you're looking at, you could think of on the left, um, it would only let through bluer light, and then towards the, the right, it would let through the redder light. So depending on where a source or a galaxy lands on our filter, we're measuring it at a different wavelength. Now, we use these linear variable filters in concert with a, a wide field telescope. And if you go to the next slide, uh, I'll show you how, how that looks. So the telescope is made entirely out of aluminum. And it's actually a pretty modest size. The aperture or the primary mirror is only about 20 centimeters, so kind of kind of basketball sized. And if we cut it in half there, you can see we've got three mirrors. Now a telescope's job is to, is to take light from the other side of the universe, so collimated light that has parallel rays, and it brings it to a focus at what we call the focal plane that's highlighted in that, in that square there. At that focal plane, we place an assembly of three detectors each of which has their own linear variable filter. So depending on where the light hits, we're measuring it at a certain wavelength. So you can see that light going through at a certain position. We'll make an image, and it might look something like what you see on the left there. We tally up all the light that got detected there, and from that, we've now made a single point on a spectrum. If we move our telescope so that that same source lands at a different position, so we dithered it, now we're measuring it at a different wavelength. We make another image, we add up all the photons that we detected, and then we've got another point on our spectrum. If you go ahead and repeat that about 50 times, we'll build up an entire near-infrared spectrum for that source. Um, if you go to the next slide, so, so if, we were, if we were to do this only for an individual source, that'd be really inefficient. But the beauty of SphereX is that we've, we're multiplexing heavily. So in this animation, I've hid that center LVF, and instead, we're placing a simulated image of what SphereX's sky looks like, put it to scale on that detector. And so now that we've flown in, you can see that we're measuring simultaneously a spectroscopic sample for hundreds of thousands of sources at every moment. So we measure hundreds of thousands of sources at each time. We take about 600 exposures per day, and then we do that relentlessly for two years, building up spectroscopic data set for billions of objects. <clears throat> On the next slide, uh, we, we show you how we do that. So again, we're going around the Earth, uh, around that day-night boundary, 
and we dither our linear variable filters around as we as we fill in those gaps. And so we put every single position on the celestial sphere to every position on our focal plane, and then we're measuring it at all the wavelengths. So as the sphere X goes around the Earth and the Earth goes around the sun, it gets modulated and moves around. And in six months time, we've built up a spectrum towards every point in the sky. We do this four times and to build up a redundant spectroscopic sample uh, to, to build up that robustness. Um, so on the next slide, I'll show you a simulation of what we might expect from the SphereX data set. And this is super exciting. We're flying through now. Uh, I think it's important to convey to you that this is actually, it's, it's not an artist representation. This comes from an actual simulation that was done by our colleagues at Argonne National Labs, who using what we know about the contents of the universe and the large scale structure, simulate with a trillion particles in a computer that that universe throughout cosmic time and populate the galaxies that live within this dark matter web. So that blue puffy stuff that you see as we're flying through, that's the dark matter lattice. And so this kind of gives you a scale of just the, the, the vastness of the data set. I should also mention that what we're flying through right now is about one two hundredth of what the SphereX data set is going to look like. And from once we have this three-dimensional map that has all of these galaxies spread out in space, we'll do all our statistics on their clumpiness, how they're associated with their neighbors on all sorts of scales, including the large scales. And from that, to learn to tie that all the way back to the quantum fluctuations which seeded that large scale structure at the very earliest epochs of the universe. So as we're flying through, we're flying away from the observer, so we're looking back in time earlier and earlier in the universe's history. And you can see as we as we start getting out here, the number of galaxies is going down. Now that's not because the number of galaxies in the universe goes down there. It's because this is a simulation of the selection function of SphereX. So it's, it's tuned to our sensitivity and our wavelengths and what we've optimized our survey for. So now as it's getting sparser out here is a good time for me to turn back over to Dita and Euclid because that's where they start to shine and pick up where we left off. Yeah, Dita, if you could hop back in here, yeah, and tell us about the Euclid mission that you're working on. This flyby is so cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to. Yeah, so basically Euclid takes over about just about now at a redshift 0 0.8 and it's aiming to find galaxies between redshift about 0 0.8 to 1.8. And that um, that uh, that redshift range corresponds roughly to the time where dark energy was really just starting to become important kick in, and kicking in and the universe was starting to reaccelerate its expansion, and so Euclid will be will be aiming at this range, and and uh, by and we will be looking at uh, basically emission lines that, that correspond to a certain uh, quantum transition in, in hydrogen, and that happens to fall in the lab. It falls into the visible part of the spectrum, but when once you get redshift, once you get the universe expanding and looking at these galaxies, these this this feature or this part of the fingerprint in the spectrum of galaxies gets redshifted into into the near infrared, and that's why Euclid um, has one of the two instruments is an infrared uh, instrument. But generally, Euclid looks a little bit different to SphereX. Uh, the configuration is a little bit more familiar. Um, and it will also be orbiting uh, much further away from Earth. So if you show the next graphic that we have, you'll see that the uh, the, the Euclid um, spacecraft will we will be sending it uh, to something called the second Lagrangian point of the Sun-Earth system, uh, which is about uh, just under a million miles away from Earth, so far outside the, the moon's orbit around the Earth. And it will be, it will be orbiting um, the Earth and the Sun simultaneously at that point. And the point, the reason why we, we want to go to the second Lagrangian point is it's, it's a particularly stable point in the Sun-Earth system. Uh, and it, it, the reason why that's important is because you need, if you go there, you need less fuel 
um, to, to correct your orbit. Because obviously, the amount of fuel is limited because this thing is very far away. So like there's a gas station there, uh, a hydrazine gas station. So, so of course, we want to conserve fuel. And that's why it's important to go to one of these stable points. Um, and so the spacecraft itself um, will look, I have a, a little graphic to that will show you what the spacecraft will look like. This is CGI, but it almost already looks like this. In fact, the, um, the payload module just arrived to Italy this week, uh, where it's being assembled together into the full spacecraft that you see spinning uh, on your screen. So this is what you could look like. So you have this cylindrical part on, that's on top now. That's the telescope part. It's a reflector telescope. It has three mirrors. And the primary mirror um, is 1.2 meters. In, in width, which I guess is about four foot. Um, and so, so that's the telescope part. And then the middle part is a so-called focal plane uh, where the light from the telescope will focus and it, con it contains two instruments. One is a visible light instrument that I'm not talking about today. And it's just, uh, it's a made up of similar chips to um, the detector chips that you might have in your, in your um, camera phone. And then you have a near infrared detector is also just an array of four by four chips. Um, and then at the very bottom, or at the very top right now, is the so-called um, service module, which contains a computer and the fuel tanks. And that computer basically controls where the telescope is pointing, and it's also talking to Earth. It's talking uh, th through um, three main really big antennas in uh, Argentina, Australia, and, and Spain, so that, you know, as the Earth spins, we can stay in contact if we need to. And then you have, of course, this flat bit on the side, I guess on that side for you, where uh, that's the solar panels, basically, which, and it's also a, a shield that shields um, the telescope and the electronics from solar radiation, which might heat it up. But it also, of course, powers some of the electronics. So the two instruments in the focal plane will be taking images of the sky through the by collecting the light through the telescope. And let me show you what those images might look like. So if you show the next picture that I have for you, so in the near infrared instrument will be taking you know images in the infrared with three different filters, which will just be fields of galaxies. But then there will also be a spectroscopic exposure. This is called slitless spectroscopy, where the light from all the sources in the field of view will be going through kind of a glorified prism. And, and these little lines that you see in this picture are basically the spectra of distant galaxies, which are the little ones, and then the very saturated spectra of, of, the, of the stars in our Milky Way galaxy, which we don't care about in this particular uh, context. Um, and, so, and so the really tricky thing here is that your field of view is going to be full of all these overlapping spectra. And that's, that will create, you know, a trick. it means that we need to use very sophisticated data, data analysis methods to extract those spectra, those emission lines and those red shifts. And so one of the ways we're going to do that, which is basically the simplest way, is to have um, these grisms, these, these um, you know, fancy prisms, we're going to mount them in the telescope, several different ones at different angles, so that this picture will be rotated and it will be easier to disentangle these different spectra. But also we've been building, you know, for years, uh, tens and hundreds of people have been building this sophisticated software pipeline to extract all of these re really tricky things. And so we'll get spectra, we'll get spectra of tens of millions of galaxies all across the extra galactic sky. And we will also make three dimensional maps using these spectra and we will statistically, statistically extract those acoustic bubbles and, and connect redshift to distances that way. And so we will make, we will try to reproduce um, what Hubble did a hundred years ago, hopefully do something a little bit better than that. And so let me show you what Hubble did a hundred years ago. If you see the, if you look at the next picture. That's actually Hubble's plot from his paper where he plotted velocity against distance and velocity corresponds to redshift. And you see this line of increasing velocity with distance. Of course, he got the numbers quite wrong, but the trend was still there. We know the universe is expanding. And so if you zoom out massively now, you get a plot like this, which is what we're doing nowadays in cosmology. And so it's not just Euclid. There's been several experiments that have been trying to, to make this connection. And so there's been uh, several ground-based experiments and their results, um, specifically to do with redshift distance relation, uh, I've put on this plot with the colorful single dots. And then I've shown you what we think Euclid will do and how it will fill this gap in distance and redshift with, with very, very small error bars that you can't even see because they're hiding behind the points. And so this is what Euclid will do. And so I've put on here what, uh, what experiments have done so far and what Euclid will, might do. And But I've also put four, four lines on here. And these lines, they correspond to different universes, different types of universe that we might live in. And you can see that even already all the data that exists is lying very close to this solid line 
And this solid line corresponds to a universe that is only 5% made of regular matter that we're made of, so-called baryonic matter. 25% of it is made of dark matter and 70% of the universe is made of dark energy. And that's what all the data is pointing at. And we, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to, to do with Euclid and with Spherex and with, with um, all these different experiments is try to really um, get this data really, really precisely, make these lines really, really precisely and try to understand all the properties of dark energy and how it impacts the, acceler the accelerated expansion in the universe. And of course, of inflation in the case of SphereX and try to understand what that implies about fundamental physics. And I personally am really excited about that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dita. That is just so cool. Um, so let's bring Phil back and then just let me mention uh, as of now, Euclid's scheduled to launch in a little over a year and SphereX in just a few years. And I also wanted to note that, as many of you that uh, are familiar with NASA may already know, all of this data is will be publicly available. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, I think, um, I hope we conveyed some of our excitement for this upcoming, uh, you know, missions. And, uh, you know, we've concentrated, Data and I are cosmologists, and so that's that's kind of our area. But I think what's really going to be exciting is that we're shoveling all of this data just out into the community, the astronomical community, but also just the, the general public. And those data sets are going to have so much information. Just in, in the case of SphereX, there's going to be billions of galaxies with spectroscopic uh, data, hundreds of millions of main sequence stars, hundreds of brown dwarfs, and all sorts of other stuff. Euclid is going to cover supernovae. They're going to do gravitational lensing. There's going to be, you know, millions of galaxy mergers. And perhaps the most exciting stuff is just what we haven't even thought of yet. Right? The discovery space, when you do these kinds of huge surveys and just, you know, deliver a, a really big data set out into the the world of astronomers to, to mine and glean as much information as possible out of there. If I had to bet right now, I'd say the most exciting thing to come out of SphereX is, is really something that we haven't thought about right now. So I, I'm really excited and uh, I hope we, we conveyed our uh, some of that excitement to you today. Oh, yeah. Very cool, you guys, both of you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it's going to be great to see like just what becomes of all this great data. So I think this is a great time to see what kind of questions we have out there. So Caitlin, uh, what are you seeing out there in the in the media world? Sure. Um, so this one is for Phil. Musical Wolves on YouTube asks, can Spherex see a galaxy behind a galaxy? Does anything block its view? Is it possible for it to see through? Well, so it, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question, and it depends on the contents of the different two different galaxies and uh, and uh, what, you know, what the line of sight that goes through it. So, you know, that absorption features, those will imprint different features. So if you have like a background illuminating galaxy and let's say, you know, really, you know, young and has lots of star formation and... Um, you know, lots of UV, so really blue, and then the the galaxy that's in front of it, um, you know, could have lots of molecular clouds and dust and stuff. What you would see from the background source would have an absorption fingerprint from the foreground source. So, uh, you know, it's hard to disentangle those. We always have to deal with the resolution of our, you know, we can only measure so fine of a thing. We use the word confusion in uh in um in astronomy but mean it literally but the beauty of spectroscopic is that you know if you have two spectra that are on top of each other and if you have a high redshift galaxy and a low redshift galaxies you can see by separating out the colors the different stuff that's in both of them great thank you um we have another one this one's for dita um, this is a good question. How far away does something have to be for it to redshift? Um, it's not about distance, really. It's about the this apparent motion of it with respect to the observer. But I guess you could also you could be asking actually about how far does a galaxy have to be in order for the expansion of space to redshift it. And I mean, in principle, that's not it's not a hard 
limit you know it's just becomes more and more red shifted so it, and it, it is really about the apparent velocity but uh yeah it, it's just that the more the further you look the more it seems red shifted which has to do with the expansion of the universe but of course you know there are also galaxies do actually move around because of gravity as well so there this is actually a, a really interesting topic that I, I work on but i definitely don't have time to talk about it but there's something called redshift space distortions which means that the galaxies are moving around a little bit as they're kind of going with the expanding space and those redshift space distortions actually can tell us a lot about our theories of gravity and they can we can test einstein's theory with that and that's also really exciting Thank you, Dita. That is very exciting. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, this one I, I think would be for Phil. So Ray on LinkedIn asks, how fast is the universe expanding? Does it expand at the, the speed of light? So, okay, when we talk about, so that, that plot that, that Dita showed, we call that the Hubble flow. And if you look at what we call H naught or how fast it's expanding today, um, it's around, so 67 to 70 ish kilometers per second per megaparsec. Okay. So let's, let's, let's think about that for a second. Um, it's actually a very convenient unit because we think about, okay, a megaparsec, that's a huge distance. So let's, let's just answer that question at a megaparsec, which is a, you know, a distance, um, that's, uh, you know, pretty cosmologically far away from us. But that means that those galaxies are basically moving away from us at 70 kilometers per second at that at that distance. So uh, that's how far away. Also interesting about that expansion rate, if we now think, OK, kilometers per second per megaparsec. OK, kilometers, a unit of distance. Megaparsec is a unit of distance. So you can convert things around and those distance cancel out. And then you're left with one over seconds. So it's an inverse time. If we invert that time, you'll get something around 14 billion or 13.8 billion. And that's the age of the universe. Wow. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Phil. Thank you very much, Dita. So folks, that's about all the time we have tonight. So I wanna thank both of you, Dita, Phil, thank you so much. Caitlin, of course, all the folks behind the scenes. And of course, all of you out there for tuning in. As Caitlin said earlier, you know, this is your space program and this is one way for you to participate in it, and we appreciate that, so thank you. So please join us next month when we'll talk with JPL scientist Josh Willis about the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich satellite's first year in space. That'll be a good one. Until then, be safe and stay well. Good night.